good morning. Uh, very, very excited to be with you this morning. Very excited to share this word. Uh, we're going to go much deeper into kingdom dynamics uh, as we begin 2019, this first quarter. We're really going to go deeper into the things of the kingdom. We're going to begin to share with you uh, some dynamics and some characteristics to understand what are the characteristics of the kingdom. But before we get started, I'm going to ask Dickie to open us in prayer. Father, we come before you today and thank you so much that you've allowed us to enter into this new year. And Father, we know that you have a plan and a purpose for each person. And Father, we pray this morning that this word would go forth and touch each person that you've called it to touch, Father, now and in the future as people watch it. Father, I pray for the anointing to be on clay and on the word that he speaks and on those that hear it. And Father, we just rejoice in you and thank you so much that you have made this day for us in Jesus' name. Amen. Jesus' name. Amen. Uh, what, what we have uncovered, I think, in, in the last number of years is... The kingdom of God on earth as it is in heaven is is a the, the culture of the kingdom is is a bit different than the culture of what most of us cut our teeth on, which is Christianity. And uh, again, a little of this may smack your traditions about a little bit, uh, but there is a there is a there's a greater measure of intimacy with God that is found in the culture of the kingdom than I ever and I think Dickie as well that we ever experienced in the, just the culture of Christianity. Um, in the culture of the kingdom, it's, it's almost, I think the true culture of the kingdom is pure relationship with the Father, uh, pure relationship with His Son, Jesus. It's, it's the purest form. There's, there, it's void of any religion. Uh, it's void of the things of men, the systems of men. And so to understand whether or not that we're walking in fullness in the kingdom. And, and for years, I think we walked in parts and pieces of it, but we never walked in the fullness of the kingdom uh, for years. It, 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 it took us, in many cases, we had to shed some of the snakeskin of tradition that we learned in, in Christianity to be able to get to this purer form of, of, uh, of really understanding the potential for having deep, vibrant, fervent relationship with the Father where He is constantly with you and, and you sense His presence uh, uh, with you almost all day and, and you sense Him with you and you with Him. And it's not that you're working for Him, it's, it's that you're working with Him because His residence is inside of you. He lives within you and he desires to express himself through you and to utilize what he made and crafted you to do. Why did he put you in the earth uh, to do what he assigned you to do? And for years, I didn't even know that. I, I had no clue. I heard the scripture, greater is he who is in you than he who is in the world. But I never really fully accepted the fact that my Lord and Savior lived, His Spirit lived within me. His Spirit was in me. But He wasn't just in me to comfort me uh, as the Holy Spirit does, but to also, more importantly, enable me to fulfill a very specific plan by which He placed me in the earth. And I think we can open what we're going to talk about today and what we're going to talk about today is we're going to talk about leading from the future we're going to talk about seeing into the future you being able to see into the future to be able to think from the future not from the present which sounds you know kind of boogaloo you know thinking from the future i mean that sounds sort of mystic like but it, there's no mysticism really to it. It is absolutely a truth and it's absolutely an ability that God gives you to begin to see the future and to begin to operate intellectually around what you're seeing. Uh, Mike Croft, who sits at this table, saw something that caused him to make a decision that changed the course of his life because he was able to see something before it became something in his life. Uh, Suzanne Walker, who's not here this morning, 
began to, to train and to develop skills and, and the, the academic background uh, for something long before it became something in her life. So there is, a, there is an ability, and I myself have had many experiences where I could see something long before it became something. And what I want to do this morning is I want to tap that in you. I want you to become aware of the fact that you are enabled by God to see the future and to, and to call the future, the plan that God has for your life, to call it into your life and make it part of the present. Because literally, you have to see it, you have to know it in order for it to become that. But if you don't know that there's another set of eyes that God has given you, beside the two that sit in your head, then you will go through life ignorant of the fact that God has equipped you with another set of eyes, and these eyes can look out and see what your future is. These eyes have the ability to look beyond yourself, beyond these eyes, and these are, these are the eyes of the heart. These are the eyes of the spirit that live within you. It's real important to recognize that you are a three-part being. You are a spirit. You happen to live in a body, and you have a soul. And your soul is your mind, will, and emotions. That is where your intellectual capacities are, where your emotional capacities are. But that's not to be confused with your spirit. Your spirit is what lives eternally. And the spirit is the real you. It is the real you. In fact... Interestingly enough, God said he foreknew you before, the, before the foundation of the earth. He, he said that he sat down with you, Psalm 139, and he made a plan for your life before, and he prepared works for you to attend to before the earth was even built. And it is written in your book. It is written in the scroll of your life. It's in your spirit what that is. So the capacity to see out and to touch the future and bring it into the present is within all of us. But if you're not aware of this, if you're not awakened to the fact that you, God has a specific purpose and a specific plan for your life, you can go through your entire life looking only through these eyes and that's all that you'll ever see. So part of... Part of what God made me to do and what he purposed me to do, particularly in this next few years, is to help people get into their purpose, to help them be able to see and to see out into the future and know exactly what God's will is for their lives and, and be able to, to awaken them to the fact that God has a specific plan. Now, we're going to cover a lot of scripture today because a lot of people will challenge this. Uh, and, and what they need to challenge is not me on what I'm teaching this morning. They need to challenge the Word of God because I'm going I'm to bring it to you straight from the Word. And, and let me just pray for all of you that are on here now. Father, in the name of Jesus, I just pray you would open our eyes, the eyes of our heart. You would cause us to, to receive and comprehend with, with great understanding by the Spirit, this, this teaching that allows us to reach out and touch our future, that allows us to reach out and, and begin thinking from our future, begin to make decisions toward our future by faith. Lord, just open our hearts now, open our eyes of, of our heart and cause us to be able to see this. And Lord, we, we expect testimonies from those who hear this word, hear this message uh, that they come back and share with us that, that they're beginning to see things now. They're beginning to understand their purpose now. They're beginning to even understand their past because it was but preparation for their future. So thank you. Thank you for that, Lord. Thank you for that. So we're going to start off again with, with Scripture, and, and I'm going to open up here with Ephesians 2.10. And Ephesians 2.10 says this, for we are God's own handiwork, his workmanship, recreated in Christ Jesus, born anew, that we may do those good works which God predestined, planned beforehand, for us taking paths 
which he prepared ahead of time that we should walk in them, living the good life which he prearranged and made ready for us to live. Now I'm reading from the Amplified, and again I'm reading Ephesians 2 verse 10. So what you begin to see is that God predestined, prearranged us, and I'll further show you that he sat down and wrote it in a scroll, wrote it in a book there in Psalm 139, and, and even further, I'll show you that in just a few minutes. But suffice it to say, he implanted this in your spirit, man, before time. Not only did he call you, but he also specifically arranged works beforehand that he called you to attend to. So there are many things that only you can do because you and God agreed that you would do it when he took you out of eternity and placed you into time, took you from a heavenly position and put you into the earth to fulfill a specific plan. And that's pretty heavy duty. And when you begin to wake up to the fact that everybody, everybody that's in the earth today is, a, is sent here on assignment to fulfill a plan that God chose for them to fulfill. Does everybody fulfill it? No. Do very many people go through life and never even know there is a plan? Yes. So do all Christians know that God has a specific purpose and plan for them? No. But I will maintain this to you. A man or a woman who is truly walking in the, in the, in the depths of, of a kingdom assignment on earth know with great understanding what I'm sharing with you this morning. So I would say a, a, a key characteristic of any kingdom man or woman is he can see into the future. He knows his purpose. He knows God's plan. And to the extent that you know that, to that extent are you walking in the kingdom. To the extent that you doubt that or don't know that, to that extent you have some room to make up here. You have some place to go. So perhaps this morning is paving that way for you. So if I were to title this, if I were to title what we're talking about today is, is learning to think from the future. Uh, one of the great evidences of a kingdom man or woman said is found in their ability to think from the future. One of the highest, most important levels of intelligence is found in one who can think from the future. That's a whole nother level of intelligence that typically is not available to, to, to us is an ability to think from the future. Think about the, think about the highest level of intelligence. The highest level of, of intelligence in the earth today is spirit to spirit. It's not intellect to intellect. It's spirit to spirit. And the highest form, the highest form of, of communication, spirit to spirit, is testimony. That is the word made flesh, the, mer the word made real in the life of one person in communication to another. Why? Because it carries with it an ability to impart the very same thing that that overcomer is now testifying to from his spirit into the spirit of another is impartation. Bear in mind, I didn't say revelation, I said impartation. Impartation is the ability to, in many cases, immediately walk in that power. Gold and silver have I none, but such as I have, I give you. Stand up and walk. That lame beggar never heard a Gloria Copeland teaching tape on healing. Never. He got an impartation from Peter. He got a complete, total, instantaneous impartation. And it said he was enabled to stand up and walk, and he walked into the synagogue with them. He went about with them. He became part of their company. Not only did he get up and walk, his status immediately was changed, not because he got a revelation that he had to ponder on and read scriptures over. He got an impartation that he instantly was able to get up and walk about and do what, what these guys were doing. So that's an amazing piece. And I declare in the name of Jesus that what we're talking about this morning is going to be imparted into the ears of the people who will hear this, yes. that you will instantly be able to start seeing out there what God's plan is for you, what his, what his purpose is for your life. 2019 carries an anointing with it. And this is all in preparation to 2020. When 2020 arrives, a lot of things are going to happen, but 19 is to get us prepared. It's a planting year. 
It's a year in which revelation, impartation like this is being planted into God's people such that they're prepared to rise up into their purpose. They're prepared yes. to rise up into his plan and begin to function as the army of God. Now, one of your strong keys, and we're going to talk about this more too, one of your very strong keys moving forward with this is people. You have to understand who the people are that you're connected to. And your connection's got to be with people who have vision. You, it must be with people who are beginning to walk in this. Why? Because people who have no vision will pull you out of this and pull you backwards and negate everything that God's trying to reveal to you. So that's a caution that I'm going to offer you is that when you begin to, to sense this and, and feel this, connect with people who are walking in this. Connect with people who understand where you're coming from. Because if you, try to, if you try to connect or stay connected with people that don't understand it, even senior people, senior pastors, many leaders in the church don't understand what we're talking about here. And you've got to be very, very careful to, to understand that part of the maturity of walking in this is being willing to go where God tells you to go and do what he tells you to do. So moving forward. <clears throat> Most of us, just by our training, think from the past. We think from what's called reactive thinking, and that's based on history. It's based on our own life experience. Uh, this is being married to past methods and past ways of thinking. Listen, the scriptures say it best. The traditions of men make the word of God to no effect. And that doesn't mean the written word that means the spoken word. So God could be talking to you, but if you've got a tradition mounted up in your mind that says you can't see the future, you can't hear God, you don't really have a specifically assigned purpose, then you won't receive this message. So understand the traditions of men are what we're coming against. The tradition of religion is what we're coming against here. We're coming against that. We're bringing a fresh bread word that you can eat. You can eat this word. You can eat this word and it will bring nourishment to your spirit. It'll bring supernatural strength into your physical body, into your mind, into your emotional realm, and it will absolutely charge your spirit. It charges me just to talk about it. To get to proactive thinking or thinking from the future, we often must get beyond ourselves and see through the eyes of ever widening possibility. This allowed, allows us to do what we've never done. What is it that, that I'm talking about here? To think from the future. This allows us to do what we've never done. Think from the future. God wants you to understand what his plan is for you. He really, really, really wants you to see your purpose that he has for your life. He really, really, really wants to engage you and, and get you to begin to take steps towards what he has planned, what he has laid out for your life, because to function in that capacity is to function in power and authority. Anything outside of the capacity that God's called you to walk in is not with power and authority from heaven. But the instant that you step into what that calling is, what God purposed you to do, you step into a power and you step into an authority to fulfill what God has planned for you. But guess what? You've got to see it first. You've got to see it first. You've got to know it's there. You've got to walk towards it. But if you don't know it's there, then, then you're captured. You're not going anywhere. So again, our prayer this morning is that God take the lid off, that he open our eyes of our heart and cause us to be able to see this future that, that we're talking about. What power from God allows us to see into the future? What power is it that God gives us to see into the future? Can you spell V-I-S-I-O-N? Vision! He gives us vision. He gives us vision and ability to see with the eyes of the heart. That's vision, to see what these two eyes cannot see. Vision, that's a gift from God to be able to look out and see what you can't see with your two eyes. Vision's not sight, but seeing what could be to actually see your purpose. Look at the word purpose here for a minute. Purpose means original intent. 
purpose means original intent. So no better word to describe what purpose is as it relates to what we're talking about here because purpose in this context is the original intent that God made you and placed you yes. into the earth. He created you. He, he prepared works for you. We just read it in Ephesians 2.10. So his purpose is his original intent. And what he wants us to do is to find his original intent for us in placing us in the earth. <coughs> Excuse me. To see God's original intent in putting you in the earth, you have to understand you're not an accident. You're not aimlessly designed to roam through life unattended, unknown and, and, and completely, totally inconsequential. You're designed to make a difference. You're designed to be a, a force of nature in this earth. You're designed to do great things in this earth. God wants to be glorified through your life. And in order for, you, for him to be glorified through your life, you've got to give him permission to do that. And in order to give him permission, you have to know that you're designated to do that. Listen to this. Vision finds its source in purpose. Vision finds its source in purpose. In other words, when you know the original intent that God has for you, then vision connects and there's an empowerment that comes upon you to understand God's plan for your life. Scripture teaches that without vision, men perish. Without vision, men perish. If you don't have a vision then you're just wandering around aimlessly, which we did for years and years and years and years as Christians. We wandered around because we had no vision. We, we were trying to do right. We were trying to do good things and, and, and be good boys and don't smoke, don't chew, don't go with the girls that do. We were trying to, <laughs> we were trying to be religious with our newfound spiritual awakening. We had no clue that there was much more to it than what we, what we could gather through, through our, our Christian circles. <clears throat> Without vision, men perish. Vision is seeing the future from the present. God didn't give us birth to primarily see with the eyes. He gave us vision to see with our heart. What's in that? What's, what are the evidences for this? Uh, what, what, what are the evidences that this is, this is what God's will is? Does God have something specific for us to do? Could it be that he made us to fulfill a work that he prepared in advance for us to do? I'm going to read this out of the NIV now. For we are God's workmanship created in Christ Jesus to do good works which God prepared in advance for us to do. That's a simpler version, but that's Ephesians 2.10 again. Now let's look at Psalm 139, verse 16. Psalm 139, verse 16. All the days ordained for me were written in your book before one of them came to be. Psalm 139, verse 16. God wrote down in a book the destiny and kingdom purpose for each of our lives. Look at Philippians 2.13. Philippians 2.13. For it is God who works in you both to will and to do for his good purpose. Romans 8, verse 29 and 30. For whom he foreknew... He also predestined to be conformed to the image of his son, that he might be the firstborn among, among many brethren. Moreover, whom he predestined, those he also called, whom he called, these he also justified, and whom he justified, these he also glorified. Now there's five things that Paul mentions here, very important. We've talked about these in some of the sessions before. Five things here that you need to write down. What did Paul say? Number one, who he foreknew. Number two, who he predestined. 
Number three, who he called. Number four, who he justified. And number five, who he glorified. So there you have it. For new, predestined, called, justified, and glorified. Do you think we have a calling on our life? Do you think God set us aside to fulfill a purpose? Let's just keep reading. Paul told Timothy in 2 Timothy 1.9 that purpose and grace were given to them before time began. Who saved us and called us, not because of anything we have done, but because of his own purpose and grace. This grace was given us in Christ Jesus before the beginning of time. Would you say that might have been a few years ago? Absolutely. So God is telling us through his word, not only did he give us this purpose, not only did he assign us a plan and work to do, but he even provided the grace for us to be able to do it before he made time. Before time began, he gave us the grace to fulfill our calling. So there's never to be a doubt or a worry. If God tells you to do some great thing, don't worry about it because he's already given you the grace to do it. It's a finished work. All you have to do is have the courage to show up. Let me say that again. When you wake up to this, now your only responsibility is have the courage to show up. I got to tell you, there are people who have gotten to this place right here in their life and did not have the courage to show up. Don't be robbed by a lack of courage. Just read the first chapter of Joshua and see how many times they were encouraged to have courage. <coughs> over and over and over and over and over. God knew in, in, in the first chapter of, of Joshua, he knew that the greatest thing that they had to overcome, it wasn't even their faith. It was their courage. And so this takes some courage to walk in, particularly if God's telling you, if you've been working in corporate America for 19 and a half years like Mike did, and God said, leave there and go start a donut shop, that's going to take some courage to do that. That's going to take some real courage to leave the traditions of your past and all your security blankets that come to break with that and go step out here in faith and do something totally different. That's going to take more courage than you have, but not more than God can give you. Let me say that again. To walk in this, often you're going to be required to have great courage, and it will be more courage than you have, but not more than God can give. That's very, very important. This means that when we find our purpose, we'll also discover the grace that has been apportioned to us for that purpose. When we realize, what we realize is that in this purposed activity, there is grace. What is grace? It's a profound ability to do what we might consider impossible. I can tell you right now what I feel God's told me to do is impossible. I told Dickie earlier today, I've run out of my capabilities. Where I'm, what I'm doing right now, where I'm going right now, is way above my pay grade. Um, I, I have, I have no way to achieve what what I feel God's called me to do. So, if you understand, the grace is already there for you to to fulfill this. That's a very encouraging word from the Word of God. That when He speaks these things to you to do. That, you have, that he prepared the grace for you to do it before he even put you in the earth and before the earth was even made. The, the two stages of foreknowledge and predestination all occurred before time began. They happened in the eternal realm of God outside of the time realm. So God prepared the earth before he put Adam in it. You, do you realize that? He, he prepared it. He got it, all, he got it all fixed up. Then he... Then he got Adam and snatched him out of eternity and put him in there. He had prepared it before Adam actually got there. And that's a great model that everything that he's calling us to do has already been prepared. All he wants us to do is have the courage to show up, to fulfill it. That's, that's really good news, by the way. The next stage is, the, the next stage is called 
stage where we begin to get glimpses of what we were made to do. And that's what we're talking about this morning. We begin discovering what is written in the books of heaven about us. That's what we're waking up here. That's what we're talking about. We're stimulating in the spirit realm. We're stimulating that in you to awaken to the fact that God has a great plan for your life, a tremendous plan. He's got a great purpose for your life, but you must wake up to and snatch yourself out of this natural realm that we've been living in and begin to see by the eyes of the spirit, by the eyes of your heart into the spirit realm to understand exactly what it is God has planned for you. Now, I know some of you are probably saying that man has lost his ever-loving mind because he's talking about all kind of crazy things that are hard to understand. And I understand that. I really do understand that it doesn't sound natural because the fact is it ain't natural. It's supernatural. And to get into this realm, you have to be willing, give God permission to take you into that realm. Well, a lot of people are not going to go where they're not comfortable. And if that's, if you're that person, the Bible says that the, this path is narrow and only a few will walk this path. That means that you said, okay, I'll go so far, but if it requires more courage than I have, I'm not going to do it. If it breaks with the traditions of my understanding, I ain't going there. Uh, I mean, you're putting all kinds of limitations on it. That's a narrow path that, that many are called, few are chosen. Not everybody is going to walk this path, and I totally understand that because there's going to be a lot of challenges along the way that are going to challenge your traditions, are going to challenge everything about you. Now listen, listen how normal this is. How will a man or woman receive the kingdom of God? Through much tribulation. Where I maintain the tribulation's greatest is in our mind. It's not actually tribulation of, of anything else. Where the, where the fire rages is to enter truly, honestly, get into the, into the meat of the kingdom of God You've got to go through some really, a lot of things that have got to burn up in your mind. Bones, uh, bones have to break. You, you absolutely have to be willing to, to allow God to go in and rip out a lot of things that, that have been ingrained in you. And as you get older, as Dickie and I can tell you, it's harder. You resist those things even more when you're older. Uh, to, to, to allow God to rip your own traditions out. And, that's, and it's difficult. That's why the word says, how will a man receive the kingdom of God? Through much tribulation. <coughs> what is the predestined plan of God for my life? What is written in my book? Now let's look at Psalm 40. Verses 6 through 8. I told you I was going to bombard you with Scripture, but I need to be able to back up what I'm maintaining, what I'm saying here this morning, and that is that you can see your future, and here's why. I'm giving you this evidence. Sacrifice and offering you did not desire. My ears, have, my ears you have opened. Burnt offerings and sent offering you did not require. Then I said, Behold, I come. In the scroll of the book, it is written of me. I delight to do your will, O God, and in your law, and your law is in my heart. Psalm 40, verse 6 through 8. And your law is in my heart, and your law is in my heart, and your law is in my heart. What is that? That's saying you have the capacity to see exactly what God has laid out for you in your heart. How? By the eyes of your heart. And so whatever is written in your book in heaven is also written in your heart. If you want to discover what is in your book, look what is in your heart. What's in your heart? Jeremiah 1 verse 5. Really, really, really important scripture. <clears throat> Before I formed you in the womb, I knew you. Can, you. can you grasp that? Before I formed you in the womb, I knew you. This is God talking. Before you were born, I sanctified you. 
I ordained you a prophet to the nations. Now I'm stacking scripture upon scripture upon scripture upon scripture about God foreknowing you, predestining you, creating you to fulfill a specific plan, a specific purpose, a specific work that he even prepared beforehand for you to do. And then he gave you the grace to be able to perform what he called you to do. Are you beginning to get that? Is that opening up in your heart? Are you beginning to see there is an, an incredibly awesome plan that God is beginning to unveil to his people to know and understand, oh, there is a purpose for my life. Yes. Most people wander aimlessly and hopelessly because they don't know what they were made for. And, and, and so I'm going to say this. Vision is the ultimate motivator. Vision is the ultimate giver of energy. Inter a vision is the ultimate life giver. Because when you touch this and you awaken to the fact that this is what God made me to do, you're going to have an excitement in your spirit that's going to give your physical body energy. If you're sick, you're going to get healed. If you can't see, you're going to see. If you can't hear, you're going to hear. You're going to find the people that you're called to fulfill this with. They're going to come alongside you. And all of a sudden, what was it becomes. What, what was is no more. Because vision brings the ultimate, is the ultimate life-giving substance. A lot of my friends have a drug background. Uh, I'm not proud to say I got a little bit of one myself. And part of the journey in the 60s and the 70s was all the different stuff that was coming out, the different drugs that were coming out. And people, oh, this is better than that one. And so there was this search for that. And what I'm telling you right now is this part of, of, of escaping sort of the Christian culture and getting into the kingdom culture and finding my purpose and finding God's, this is the ultimate drug. This is the ultimate high because it's with you 24 hours a day, seven days a week when you awaken to what God put you in the earth to do. And I'm stacking these scriptures up so you can understand how real God's plan is and opening up the true kingdom culture. And the true kingdom culture is purpose, function, utility, grasping the fullness of heaven so that it can be brought to earth and portrayed to earth, revealed to earth. Why? So God can be glorified through your life. Before I was formed, I knew you. That means in eternity past, you had a meeting with God. One of the reasons he sent you down to creation through a birthday, through a place in time, is to fulfill a specific assignment. Can I say that again? Before I formed you, I knew you, God said. That means that in eternity past, you had a meeting with God. One of the reasons he sent you to creation through a birthday, through a place in time, is to fulfill an assignment. He made you specifically to do specifically a work. What prevents us from fulfilling his fullness in our lives? Listen to this. Because here's where many people are getting robbed. This is why many people will never fulfill this. Scripture tells us many are called, yet few are chosen. The answer to that question the answer to the question of why many are called and few are chosen, there's, there's a reason why people don't fulfill their calling and never touch their destiny, never touch their purpose, never really get into the vision of God. Here's the answer. An unbelieving heart caused by the God of this world, the one we are living in now. Who's called the God of this world? Satan is called the God of this world. Important. This is very important. Not saying an unbeliever here. Make the clear distinction. But an unbelieving heart that can snuff out a great plan by simply accepting a good plan. There's the great plan, which is God's, and there's the good plan, which is man. We're Christians. We want to do something good. And so we eat from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, not realizing that the good fruit on that tree is just as deadly as that evil fruit. 
And so we accept something good and snuff out the great plan that God had for our lives. The greatest slaves are those who don't know they are. The strength of the oppressor lies in the ignorance of the oppressed. The God of this world has blinded the minds of, uh, of the unbelieving so that they might not see the light of the gospel of the glory of Christ, who is the image of God. 2 Corinthians 4, verse 4. Understanding your calling is a journey. Now here, here's Dickie and I, we're in our 70s. We've been at this for 35, 40 years, and we're just waking up to this. We'd love to say that, this, that we knew this right off the bat, but the truth is we wandered around and we, we, we sort of drank up everything Christianity had for us and we still felt short, thirsty, thirsty, hungry. And so we began to call out to God, and when we began to call out to God, he began to reveal the kingdom to us. And he began to point us in the way of the kingdom. Yet if you go to so many places in Christianity, you don't hear the kingdom preached. I mean, only now is it beginning to, do you, are you beginning to hear people talk about the kingdom more and more and more and more ministries? Uh, some have been talking about it for years, but not necessarily heard. Uh, now they're being heard. More and more people are beginning to understand the answer is not in Christianity. By the way, that word was only used twice in the New Testament. It was the pagans referring to the followers of Christ. That's a term that we picked up, Christianity. But Jesus' entire ministry was the kingdom of God. And somehow we, we've, uh, we've not taught that. We, we hadn't taught the kingdom as, as Jesus taught it. But it, it, after this, as you begin to read the New Testament, and particularly the teachings of Jesus, you're going to see how often he referred to the kingdom of God. You're going to see what a major impact he made with what he taught about the kingdom. And then you're going to see the mystery of how the enemy has so subtly blinded us by giving us a Christian message that scant ever talked about the kingdom of God. Talked about everything else, but didn't talk about the kingdom. Moving on. Understand your calling is a journey. Part of that journey is separating us from the ways of the world, pointing us to the ways of God, which is the kingdom. My calling is his business. My calling is God's business. It ain't my worry. It ain't my stress. <laughs> it's not my freak out. It's not. It's his. And that's part of the enter, entering into the rest is when you can yes. take whatever it is that God's telling you to do and enter into his rest with it and know it isn't your burden to carry. It's not your responsibility. All you got to do is show up. Don't let his business become your business. This is a real, real key here. You can't let his ministry, the thing he's given you, become your ministry. So many times you see people on TV pleading for money, and if you don't give this ministry money, then the gospel's not going to go out. It's not going to be preached. Well, that's a man who's taken possession of his ministry. Uh, God has told me to build this giant gazillion-dollar church, and if we don't do it, then souls are going to be lost. Uh, this is what God, this is my ministry. No, it's not your ministry. It's God's ministry, and if it's your ministry and it's your possessions, if you're a businessman, if it's your possessions and your business, then it ain't God's business. It ain't God's possession. So we got to turn loose of any claim we have to anything that God's called us to do because it's his business, not our business. Get free of that. Don't let things possess you. Possessions have no right to possess a true kingdom man or woman. <clears throat> My businesses are not my businesses. They're his, his responsibility, his concern, his to do with as he pleases. The instant we retake matters into our own hand, doing things our own way, we banish ourselves from the tree of life because we just entered into partaking of fruit from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. And when you abandon yourself from the tree of life, you abandon yourself from an ability to hear God. Genesis 3, verses 21 through 24. 
In the world, little is accomplished without toil. In the kingdom, his burden is light. Far more is accomplished with less effort. When I leave peace, righteousness, and joy, I venture back into my own self. My best is my worst before God. Arthur Burt said that. Why? Because it's the place I'm least dependent upon God. To the extent you are totally dependent upon God, to that extent are you walking in the kingdom. To the, depend, to the extent that you're dependent upon man for anything, and, and, and most of all, the one man that you're most dependent upon is yourself. To the extent that you're dependent upon man, to that extent are you not walking in the kingdom. You know, Russ Welch here just commented on uh, Arthur quote, where your hand is, God's hand isn't. <laughs> yeah, for sure. Uh, if work is produced in toil, we've either left the rest or entered into an ungodly work. We can leave the rest in a godly work. When we leave God's way, we begin to sow fig leaves. That's important to understand. When we're operating in the kingdom, things work for us. When we're operating in the world, we must work for things. Now, did God design you to be able to see in the future? I think we've established, we have absolutely established that God ordains you to be able to see into the future. He ordains you to be able to look out and see things before they ever become things. He's speaking even now as we're talking that he has created a specific purpose. He has a specific purpose in mind for you. Do you think he would provide you with a vision beforehand of what he's asking you to do? Absolutely. It's in your scroll. It's in your book. We, we mentioned it. Psalm 139 verse 16. God set a purpose in my life, Ephesians 2.10, that cannot be stopped if I can see it. In my case, I've seen it for years. I've worked toward it for 30 years now, and now it unfolds. But for years, I didn't know what I was seeing. I didn't know what I was doing. Uh, I had no clue what I was doing. But now I do. And I think what, what, what God wants us to do is take the things that we've learned, the mistakes that we've made, the lack of understanding that we've had and be able to pull that in and be able to teach others how to walk in this, how to find your purpose, how to fulfill that that God's planned for you. That's the gift he gave me. That's the, that is the anointing that I carry is to help people find their purpose. Because what the kingdom offers, the kingdom offers no job. The kingdom only offers opportunity. And if you realize that faithfulness is the cornerstone of promotion in every kingdom event, then you understand the dichotomies between an opportunity and a job. Now, I'm not just talking about marketplace. I'm talking about a mindset. If you have a mindset of I'm working for God, that's a job. If you have the mindset is I'm, 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 I'm walking with God, we are fulfilling together what he's placed me in the earth to do. Now I'm working with God. That's a mindset. One of the key purposes in my life is helping others find what they're called to do, to help them see by the eyes of their heart and not judging by their natural eyes. God has things he wants done specifically in the earth, and he made us to do it. In fact, only you can do what God called you to do. Everything is created for purpose. Now, it's important to understand this. Jesus said it is finished. Now, this, I'm going to wrap this up with understanding that everything we're talking about here is a finished work. And I know that's a hard concept to, to grasp, a finished work. In other words, we, we are beginning what God's already finished. God's the one that starts at the end and begin, begins at the end. Yes. That's, he, he does that. So when you start to realize you're predestined, called, ordained, have the grace for it's already, what we're also talking about is this is a finished work. This doesn't require your toil or strain. Why? It is a finished work. The life we're living is a finished work in God's eyes. God finished your life, then gave you birth to start it. God begins with the end first, makes known the end at the beginning. That's vision. He makes known the end at the beginning. 
God makes known the end at the beginning. Vision today is a glimpse of your tomorrow, where you're headed. Isaiah 46, verses 9 and 10. Guys, Isaiah 46, verses 9 and 10 says, I am the God who sets the end at the beginning. My purpose will stand. I finish things first, then I start them. I make known the end at the beginning. Our future is God's history. God's taken us where we've already been. Success is inevitable to anyone who follows God's plan. Now let me emphasize here, success is success in God's eyes, not man's eyes. Now here's a kingdom key. Here's an important kingdom key. And whenever you hear any of us refer to here is an important kingdom key, this is worth writing down because this key and others like it cost a lot of time, money, blood, sweat, tears, mistakes, setbacks to get this key. The reason many have no discipline in their life today is they've never seen their end. Men with no vision perish. Proverbs 29, verse 18. Men without vision perish. If you crank the vision of God into your life where you are completely undisciplined, you will become completely disciplined. Everything in your life will line up. Every fiber of your being will begin to give itself over to the plan and the vision and the purpose of God. You'll become consumed by it, and it will provide you with more joy and more enjoyment than anything you have ever done in your life. There is no recreation. There is no vacation. There is no nothing that you've ever done that can provide you the same amount of joy that stepping into your purpose and your plan and the vision of God. It is it, is, it will create a discipline in you that you never thought possible because all things in you will begin to line up to that vision. Your health, your mental attitude, your focus, uh, your responsibilities, your knowledge of what you have to do every given day to fulfill this, it'll begin to line up before you ever wake up. You'll, be, you'll wake up and know exactly what I've got to do today. Have you earnestly sought God for his purpose in your life? If you ask anything according to his will, he'll give it to you. Now, we're, we're coming to a closing, and we're coming to the part where, where we're going to give you the invitation to ask God. It's, the word says in 1 John 5, 14, if you ask him anything according to his will, he'll do it for you. And so we're down to the part right now where some of you want to ask God for something. You want to ask God, I want to be able to see my future. I want to be able to understand that God has a great plan for my life. I don't have a clue. Well, if you ask anything according to his will, this is what it says, 1 John 5, 14, he'll do it for you. So we're going to agree with you that we're going to ask God for you. Every person that's listening to this, we're going to ask God, Lord, Help us to, to know, to see, to understand what your will is in our lives. We're asking according to your will. You said if we ask you anything according to your will that you would reveal it to us. So everybody who will ever hear this now, ever hear this on YouTube, ever hear this on Vimeo now or 50 years from now, Lord, that they will be able to take 1 John 5, 14 and ask according to your will and just uh, have heaven open up and reveal to them exactly what they were placed in this earth to do. If you can see your destination, you can make your plans accordingly. Vision disciplines your whole life. Let me say that again, because this is a mouthful right here. If you can see your destination, you can make your plans accordingly. We go to Colorado occasionally skiing, and we're in South Georgia where it's generally hot. So when we know our destination is Colorado and we're going into the mountains and we're going to be skiing, then we have 
clothes that are in our attic that we don't wear here. But because we know our destination, we pack the clothes accordingly. We make provision for the fact that we're going into very cold weather that's not like it is here. So this is exactly the same thing. If you know the destination of where God's called you, you're going to pack your suitcase accordingly. You're going to begin to make all your plans. Suzanne had no clue when she worked as a paralegal and she felt in her heart years ago that she was to go into solar. And she, she, she just began to go and take courses and go to night school and do, make all the sacrifices to go get uh, uh, her, her degree in solar. Uh, not knowing where she would end up, but she knew it was part of the plan. She knew in her heart of hearts. So she packed her suitcase with study and, and a background. So I want to encourage some of you are beginning even now to, to get a glimpse of what God's saying to you. You're beginning even now to open up and, oh, maybe that was what God wanted me to do. So I just sense as I'm sitting here talking to you now on camera that some of you are beginning to get a glimpse some of you are beginning to understand, oh, now I understand that. So we've asked according to God's will, expect the vision of God, the plan of God to come forth into your life. And as you begin to expect that, open yourself up to receive. <clears throat> Don't be bound by your past traditions or your knowledge or your understanding. Because if you're bound only by your understanding, you will never walk in the fullness of this. <clears throat> now, when God begins to reveal this to you, I'm going to give you another scripture here. Habakkuk 2, verse 2. Write it on a tablet. <laughs> Write down what God shows you and make it plain. There's a reason that scripture is in the Bible. Write your vision that God gives you on a tablet and make it plain. Habakkuk 2, verse 2. Why? Because when the enemy comes to steal this vision that God's given you, and he will, you can say to him as Jesus did, it is written. If you don't write down what God shows you, I promise you, you're giving the enemy the greatest opportunity to steal the vision of God. Have the discipline to do Habakkuk 2 to write down what God's telling you and keep it in a precious place. Keep it before you. Keep before you what God says to you as a result of having heard what we're talking about here now. Now here's another kingdom key. This is a very powerful kingdom key. People are key to this. People are key to the vision of God in your life. Go with people who are going somewhere. With others who are following God's plan in their life. Why? Because no man can take you where he has never been. This is very, 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 very important. If God gives you great vision, you're saddled up with people all around you that have no vision it won't be long before they will snatch that right out of your heart. So you get with people who understand vision. You get, let, get those people around you and get people who understand that God predestined and purposed them to go somewhere, to do something with their life and, and, and get away from people who have no vision because they will steal what God's put in your heart. Now understand this. And I'm getting ready to close. Vision is not ambition. Ambition will get you into hell. Vision will get you into heaven. And people have confused vision with ambition for years. It wasn't all that long ago. I was around a, 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 a church where the pastor said the vision was for this multi-million dollar megaplex that was going to cost God knows how many millions of dollars. And, and he wanted, you know, he, he, that was his vision for, the, for this church. It had an apartment in it and a house in it, and it had a place for the private people where they could come and view the service. And it was patterned after another big, big, big ministry. 
in my personal opinion, and I hope I'm not saying this judgmentally, was that truly the vision of God or was that ambition? And so understanding the difference between ambition and vision is really, really, really important because ambition is not applauded in heaven. In fact, let me read you this. Galatians 5, 20 and 21. Galatians 5, 20 and 21. Selfish ambition is ranked right there with murder, sexual perversion, drunkenness, fornication, and many other things. And it says one who engages this will not see the kingdom of God. And I'm not saying that your vision might not have some great plan to it so some of it may have a really great plan to it but you cannot confuse vision with ambition and call it vision and we've been guilty of doing that i've been guilty of doing that many 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 times i've been guilty of doing that so i'm not pointing my finger at anybody i'm pointing my finger at me and sometimes it takes one to know one uh and in, in this particular case that i'm referring to I'm referring to myself first because I've built my own kingdoms. I've built my own empires only to have them collapse because human hands can't touch what God's doing here. Seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. What does his righteousness mean? I went years not understanding that. His righteousness means his way, his way of doing things, it, your, his right standing way, his right way of doing things. And it means his right way, not our right way. His way is right. Our way is wrong. And listen to this. Don't do good. Do right. What is right? Right is his way. Don't do good. Do right. Right is the way of God. Right for you is determined by destination. You must often pass a lot of good things to get to the right thing. This is the narrow path that few walk. And for scriptural reference, that's Matthew 7, verses 13 and 14. Good is the enemy of best. And it's much more subtle than outright evil because evil is acknowledged disobedience. Good, not so much. Jesus had a family. Jesus had a family, yet chose his friends because they aligned with his God-given vision. His family, not so much. Vision needs right company to accommodate it. Wrong company distracts. Be around visionaries, people who are pregnant with vision. Don't keep company with folks who have no vision. They will draw you away from God's appointed purpose in your life. Vision is destroyed by people who have none. <clears throat> Ephesians 1 Verses 4 through 12, this is the last scripture, explains you are chosen to fulfill his plan and the only thing that can stop it from happening are distractions. Distractions remove our ability to see and know his will. Satan has a plan too, a plan to keep you from destiny and it's called distractions. Father, we thank you for this word. We thank you, God, that you have opened our hearts, you've opened our minds, you've, you've opened everything about us to, to allow you and grant you permission to come and speak your will into our lives, to make today different, this first work day back of 2019. Lord, to jump this early, uh, early in the year of 2019, to open our spirits up today to receive the engrafted vision of God, all that heaven has planned for us. Lord, let it be according to your will. Lord, just smoke us with your presence in 2019. Lord, let us recognize that your presence is as, is as easy as us just accepting that you're here. You're right here. Your presence, Lord. Let us, let us fight our battles in 2019 with presence, with the presence of God in our lives. Let us stay in your presence Lord, to fulfill this plan of this vision. Let us not be discouraged by the enemy's plan of distractions. 
and, and false traditions and things that would pull us away from all that you have for us. Lord, bless us with internal understanding of this. Bless us with external confirmation of this message, Lord. And I pray, Father, that confirmation come flowing into each and every person uh, from what has been taught and revealed here and shared this morning. Let confirmation roll. Let confirmation come. Let it empower. Lord, let confirmation, let, let people just run into one confirmation after another of the things that they've heard this morning. And Lord, I just pray your blessing upon each person, uh, each person that, is, that has been with us. Uh, Lord, I see there's tremendous uh, comments and sharing of this message. I see that it's going out all over. And we just pray, Lord, that you would distribute this word, that you would take it into the far corners of the world. Lord, that you would reach out and touch many, many people with this word and awaken them to their purpose and to God's plan in their life. Lord, use this word in a mighty, mighty way. We thank you for the humble setting that we're in. We thank you for, uh, Lord, having this wonderful opportunity to use this technology to take what you've imparted into us over many, many years and be able to share not just a doctrine, but a true testimony of what we're walking in, Lord. And we thank you that you're giving us the, 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 the known understanding that a man's mouth, his, his talk, and his walk, his feet have to be one and the same in order for true impartation to take place. Let us be unwilling to listen to doctrine, but Father, open-hearted to receive testimony in Jesus' name. Amen.